Today's video is brought to you by Sheath Underwear, which is helping your balls live in the modern comfort that they deserve. Look, gentlemen, how many times you've been out on the town and things are just not going well, you know? Down below. You know what's not a good way to make new friends at the bar? Constantly sticking your hands in your pants to make readjustments. We promise you, you're not nearly as stealthy as you think you are. Fortunately, there's sheath underwear, which is specifically built with you in mind. It has three individual compartments. You can see them on the outside and on the inside here and basically these keep everything cool and comfortable including this inverted kangaroo pouch for your um well let's just say your little joey it was invented by a literal u.s army soldier while he was in iraq because well you might have heard iraq it's quite warm. Trust me, what an underwear that's ergonomically designed for the shape of your body is something you just have to try. Less chafing, less sticking, less smelling. So if you're still buying your underwear from the same brand that makes your socks and your undershirts and your sister's bra, maybe it's time to give something a little more personalized to try. Right now, you guys can get 20% off sheath underwear just by clicking the link below or using the code BRAINFOOD at checkout. Alternatively, go to sheathunderwear.com forward slash brainfood. Same deal, 20% off. Do that and you're dry comfortable and wonderful balls will thank you endlessly again sheathunderwear.com forward slash brain food or just click the link below 20 percent off with the code brain food and now today's video picture for a moment an imperial german soldier of the first world war chances are the teutonic trench dweller you just conjured in your mind's eye wears on his head a distinctive and rather bizarre piece of kit a close-fitting glossy black helmet covered in shiny brass fittings and sporting a large prominent spike protruding out of the top. Known as a pickle hulb, this helmet has become an iconic artifact of the Great War used by propagandists on both sides to symbolize German militarism and barbarism. But who created the pickle hulb? What function did its signature spike serve, and what caused it to suddenly disappear from the battlefield after more than 70 years of service? Well, tighten your chin straps as we dive into the fascinating history of modern military headgear. The name Pickle Harb derives from the German words Pickle for pickaxe and Harb for bonnet or hat. The Pickle Harb was invented in 1842 by King Friedrich Wilhelm IV of Prussia, who is believed to have based his design on earlier Napoleonic era helmets worn by cuirassiers or heavy cavalry and dragoons, troops who rode to the battlefield on horseback but dismounted to fight on foot. These helmets featured tall metal crests designed to deflect blows from sabers and other edged weapons, and which could be fitted with fur, feather, or horsehair plumes for ceremonial and parade duties. Unlike its predecessors, however, the pickle hub was crafted not from metal but from leather, which was boiled to harden it and given multiple coats of black varnish. And instead of a crest, the new helmet sported a metal spike which served the same function of deflecting sword blows. While far lighter, than the helmets which inspired it, the first model pickle hub was less than an ideal design, with troops finding the helmet unwieldy to wear and difficult to keep in place, especially in windy conditions. But Friedrich Wilhelm had grown irrationally attached to his creation and refused to allow any modifications, even suggesting that troops store their mess kits inside the helmet's absurdly tall belt. The king's eccentric helmet design attracted a great deal of mockery both outside of and within Germany, with an 1842 satirical poem titled Germany, A Winter's Tale by Heinrich Hein comparing the iconic spike to a lightning rod. It reads, Yes, yes, I like the helmet. It demonstrates the loftiest wit. A kinly inspiration it was, complete with point and tip. I'm just afraid a storm will come, and only to easily hit that romantic crown of yours with a fancy lightning blitz. In 1857, Friedrich Wilhelm suffered a series of strokes and was declared unfit to rule, so his brother Wilhelm took over as Prince Regent. That same year, an improved version of the Pickle Harb was introduced with a shorter, more form-fitting belt. This model was far better regarded by the troops and would serve as the template for all subsequent Pickle Harben over the following seven decades. Nonetheless, the original 1842 design proved surprisingly influential. In 1844, Sweden and Relegia also adopted the Pickle Harb, while in 1847, the British Household Cavalry, Dragoons, and Dragoon Guards adopted their own version known as the Albert Helmet after Albert Prince Consort to Queen Victoria. Unlike his Germanic cousin, this helmet was made not of leather but of stiffened cloth over a cork framework and featured a much smaller spike. The United States Army and Marine Corps would later adopt their own version of the Albert Helmet for full dress from 1881 and 1902, while the original Pickle Harb is even thought to have inspired the iconic custodian helmet traditionally worn by British police officers or bobbies. In January 1871, Prussia defeated France 
arms in the Franco-Prussian War, and a unified German Empire was created. Shortly thereafter, Prince Regent Wilhelm, now Emperor or Kaiser Wilhelm I, issued an imperial declaration making the Pickelhalb the standard helmet of the German military and police forces. The helmet has evolved significantly from its original 1842 configuration and would continue to do so over the following decades, with several different models being produced in an effort to reduce manufacturing time and cost. The definitive model was introduced in 1895 and consisted of three main parts, a basic bowl-shaped shell made by pressing leather into a concave mold and a front and rear leather visor sewn onto the shell. These pieces were boiled to harden them, painted with several coats of black lacquer, and polished to a mirror shine. The joins between the shell and the visors were then reinforced with two brass trim pieces on the front and a brass spine running down the rear of the helmet. The front of the helmet bore an elaborate gilded brass crest indicating the wearer's unit or region of origin, the most common being the spread-winged eagle emblem of Prussia. The attachment points for the leather chin strap also featured bullseye-shaped cockades, the right-hand cockade bearing the imperial colors red, white, and black, and the left-hand cockade the colors of the wearer's home state, for example, white and black for Prussia and white and blue for Bavaria. Finally, there was the pickle harb's most distinctive feature, its large cylindrical spike, which by 1895 was mostly hollow and featured adjustable holes at its base to improve ventilation to the wearer's head. For parade use, the spike could be unscrewed and replaced with a cup-shaped device called a trichter, which held a long ceremonial horsehair plume. The color of this plume also varied according to the wearer's rank and unit. While officers of most units wore a white or black plume, musicians, the Bavarian artillery, and the Saxon guard wore a red plume. While Wilhelm I's 1871 declaration had made the basic pickle harb standard across the German armed forces, there were still numerous exceptions and variations. Artillerymen, for instance, wore a version with a ball-shaped finial called a Kugelhelm. Uhlans or Lancers continued to wear the traditional square-top Kapka helmet, and elite Jäger troops and machine gunners wore stiff cylindrical Chachko caps based on the Napoleonic Shako. An all-metal pickle harb was also produced for use by cuirassiers and often appears in portraits of high-ranking military officers such as Otto von Bismarck, Chancellor of the German Empire. This style of pickle harb was often nicknamed the lobster tail helmet due to its distinctive jointed metal neck guard. While commonly associated with Imperial Germany, the pickle harb was adopted by dozens of countries worldwide, including Russia, Portugal, Norway, Sweden, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador, Jordan, Mexico, Peru, Romania, Thailand, and Venezuela. The popularity of the helmet in Latin America was due to the widespread use of Prussian military advisors to organize and train these countries as armed forces in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Indeed, this Germanic influence is still felt to this day, with many ceremonial units such as the Chilean Color Guards, the Swedish Life Guards, the Portuguese National Republican Guards, the Romanian Gendarmerie, and the Colombian Presidential Guard Battalion continuing to wear the pickle harb while on parade. Yet despite its popularity, the pickle harb suffered from a major flaw. Its polished brass or silver fittings made it highly visible on the battlefield, turning the wearer into an obvious target. Thus, in 1892, a light brown cloth cover called the Uberzug was introduced for use on maneuvers or in combat. As the Uberzug covered the pickle hob's identifying brass plate, regimental numbers were instead sewn or stenciled in red and later green on the front of the cover. The distinctive spike was also often removed while in combat to further reduce visibility, while the shiny brass fittings were later given a dull oxidized finish to cut down on glare. Yet all these modifications proved no match for the industrialized meat grind that was the First World War. Within a year of the conflict breaking out in August 1914, the British naval blockade had completely cut Germany off from its supply of Argentine leather that was needed to manufacture the Pickelhalben. German industry was thus forced to come up with a variety of ersatz or imitation helmets made of lacquered tin, pressed felt and even cardboard to keep up with demands, but by this point the pickle hob's days were already numbered. While popularly associated with the rifle and the machine gun, the First World War was first and foremost an artillery war, with a full 60% of combat casualties being caused by shell fire. And with soldiers' bodies being largely protected behind trench walls, the majority of artillery-inflicted wounds were to the head. The bald leather pickle harb, designed to deflect saber blows, offered little protection against shell fragments and shrapnel balls. Soldiers of other nations fared even worse, having marched into battle not in helmets, but simply in cloth hats, like the French kepi and the British service dress cap. 
gap. With head injuries mounting at an alarming rate, the belligerent nations soon began casting about for a more effective means of protecting their troops. The first nation to issue a protective helmet was France, which in December 1914 introduced a simple steel skull cap designed to be worn under the standard cloth capi. Designed by Intendant General Louis Auguste Adrien, the cap weighed only 250 grams and proved remarkably effective, reducing severe head injuries by up to 70%. Over 700,000 were manufactured and issued until March 1915. However, the device had a major flaw. When struck by a bullet or high velocity shell fragment, the metal of the close fitting skull cap tended to bend inwards and penetrate the wearer's skull, allowing the often mud soaked cloth from their kepi to enter the wound and cause infections. Thus, in early 1915, the French general staff ordered the development of an improved helmet, its design once again attributed to General Adrien. Officially adopted in the spring of 1915, the Adrien helmet consisted of a bowl shaped steel shell with a long curved front visor and a stamped sheet metal crest running along its crown. A stamped metal crest could be riveted to the front to indicate the wearer's service branch, a flaming grenade for infantry and cavalry, a bugle for the elite chasseurs, crossed cannon barrels for the artillery, and so on. While a complicated design requiring more than 70 forming and riveting operations to manufacture, the Adrian was cheap to manufacture, weighed only 750 grams, and provided more than adequate protection against shell fragments on the battlefield. Nearly 20 million were produced by the end of the war, the design being widely adopted by other countries including Belgium, Italy, Russia, Poland, Spain, Greece, and the United States. Interestingly, the helmet may have provided its wearers more protection than General Adrien had originally intended. A 2020 study conducted by a team from Duke University discovered that compared to modern combat helmets, the 105-year-old design offered far superior protection against overhead explosive blast waves and affect the researchers attribute to the Adrien's helmet's distinctive raised crest. The second nation to field a standard combat helmet was Great Britain, which in September 1915 introduced the Brodie helmet, invented by Latvian-born entrepreneur John Leopold Brodie. Based on the medieval kettle hat or chapelle de fur, the Brodie helmet featured a shallow bowl with a wide brim, which could be easily stamped from a single sheet of metal in a single operation. This made the Brodie considerably stronger than the Adrien helmet, though at one kilogram it was slightly heavier. The Brodie helmet's main innovation, however, was its liner. Earlier helmets, like the Adrien, fit closely to the wearer's head, meaning that impacts from high-velocity shell fragments were transmitted directly to the skull, leading to concussions and other brain injuries. Brodie's liner, by contrast maintained a one centimeter gap between the wearer's head and the helmet shell. This, combined with the mild steel shell's tendency to dent rather than to rip under impact, saved many a British soldier from severe injury, including Victoria Cross winner Alf Pollard, who wrote of a January 1917 against the German-held town of Grand Corps, quote, something hit me in the center of my forehead and I went down like a log. For a moment I lay stunned. I recovered my steel helmet. There was a dent in the center of it the size of an orange. I went back into the road. A shell burst just behind me and a splinter hit me on the back of the head, making a second dent. A few months earlier, Pollard had gotten into an argument with a fellow soldier over whether the Brody helmet could deflect a pistol shot. To prove his point, Pollard fired his 445 caliber service revolver at a helmet from a range of 25 yards. The bullet dented the shell, but did not penetrate. But like all combat helmets before and since, the Brody was not designed to stop a full power rifle bullet and could easily be penetrated even at extreme ranges. However, under certain conditions, the helmet could and did deflect glancing shots and ricochets, and on certain occasions, bullets were reported to have entered one side of the helmet, followed the inside curve of the shell, and exited the other side without touching the wearer's head. Presumably, said wearer then immediately proceeded to the quartermaster to obtain a change of trousers. Yet, despite its effectiveness, the Brody helmet was received with some skepticism by the troops and was initially issued on a per-requirement basis to sentries, trench raiders, grenade throwers, and other specialized troops. Soon, however, the protection offered by the new headgear became widely recognized, and by 1916, the helmet was standard issue for all British Empire soldiers. A popular and effective design in various forms, the Brody would remain in service with Britain into the 1960s and with the United States from 1917 to 1942, when it was replaced by the equally iconic M1 helmet. Though Germany was the first belligerent nation to recognize the need for a standardized protective helmet, it was the last to adopt one. In 1915, General Hans Gade, commander of Army Detachment B in the French Vosges Mountains, became alarmed at the high number of head wounds his men were receiving. When his official requests for a solution fell on deaf ears, Gade took matters into his own hands and designed his own protective helmet, 1,500 of which were privately manufactured and distributed to his troops. Gade's helmet consisted of a leather skull cap with a thick steel plate covering the forehead and nose, the area where the 
the majority of shrapnel wounds were inflicted. While heavy and only moderately effective, Gade's initiative prompted the general staff to authorize the development of an official protective helmet to replace the pickle harb, which would eventually become known as the Stahl Helm or Steel Helmet. Based on the medieval Salad Helmet and nicknamed the Coal Scuttle, the Stahlheim featured a deep bell with a short visor and a large flared rear skirt, providing excellent protection to the wearer's forehead, ears, and neck. Early versions were designed to use chin straps from the pickle hob and featured a pair of hollow tubular horns protruding from the temples. These horns served two functions, first to increase ventilation and second to serve as an attachment point for the Sternpanzer, a thick armored brow plate designed for use by snipers, machine gunners, sentries, and other troops exposed to direct enemy fire. The Sturmpanzer was often issued with a 9 kg set of segmented armor plates covering the chest and abdomen, colloquially known as lobster armor. However, this armor oh, was heavy and unwieldy and offered only limited protection against bullets and was thus often quickly discarded by the troops who were issued it. First entering service during the Battle of Verdun in early 1916, by the end of the year, the Stahlheim was standard issue for all German troops, almost completely supplanting the venerable Pickelhalb. However, many officers continued to wear the Pickelhalb until the very end of the war, albeit with the spike removed to avoid making themselves obvious targets for enemy snipers. But by 1918, the Pickelhalb had disappeared altogether, with even German police units abandoning it in favor of the Chaco. The Stahlheim, by contrast, proved itself to be a robust and effective design, and with various modifications, would continue to serve the armies of Germany and several other countries throughout the Second World War and into the 1970s. Though by 1916 it had largely been replaced by the Stahlheim, the Pickelhalb remained a potent symbol of German militarism throughout the war, widely used by propagandists on both sides. In one particularly unsubtle recruitment poster created by artist Harry R. Hopps for the U.S. Army in 1917, a guerrilla sporting a Pickelhalb, Kaiser mustache, and a club emblazoned with the words culture carries off a half-naked damsel accompanied by the exhortation, destroy this mad brute. As a result of its propaganda uses, the Pickelhalb became a popular souvenir for Entente forces, with many soldiers being photographed with Pickle Hub and liberated from captured German positions. Even today, the iconic spiked helmet remains an instantly recognizable symbol of Germany, with plastic versions even being produced for German soccer fans during the 2006 FIFA World Cup. But though it served for over 70 years and filled its wearers with martial pride, the flimsy pickle hull proved no match for the mud, blood, and withering shell fire of the Great War. By 1918, it had vanished from the battlefield along with cavalry charges, bayonet assaults, giant pitched naval battles, and all the other vestiges of a bygone age of gentlemanly warfare.